at Hard Knocks tomorrow, right? Woohoo! Years and years of waiting for the Bears to be on Hard Knocks, and the wait is over tomorrow, and I can't wait. Aldo, have you seen the trailer and uh, for the first original episode? What were, what were, did you have any thoughts going into that with the trailer and everything? I thought they nailed it. You know, uh, that the trailer captured the history of the Bears of my lifetime because I started watching the Bears when Dick, Gut Dick Butkus was still playing and Gail Sayers was still playing. You know, so I go back that far. And for them to start their trailer with some of the Bears players from that era and the 70s and moving on and so forth and capturing the spirit of the city and capturing the brand of the Bears has always been hard hitting and, you know, knock people down and hard running and so forth. I thought the 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 trailer the first 30 seconds or so captured the essence of the Chicago Bears and then they segue to uh, Eberflus's and Pace's uh, Chicago Bears uh, I thought it was really well done and I, I can't wait to see what they come up with you know we're just coming off the New York Giants one and the access that they had behind the scenes from a GM and player personnel was fantastic I hope we get a glimpse of what's going on in Ryan Pose's office well not only Ryan Pose you know, I think the McCaskies have tried to keep him away now the mm -hmm. whole time. So that's kind of interesting, too, to just kind of try and get an insight. You know, like I, I always make little jokes, like the reason why we replaced Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace with Matt Eberfruits and Ryan Poles is because you only had to replace one of the name tags of each of them on the office. It saves you like 12 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> little, little details like that, just put it over the top, you know, but uh, uh -huh. I, I can around. I, I truly, I do want to kind of get an insight on, you know, what that whole ordeal is. And yeah, uh, I, I guess the teams get a final say, but it's like, if yeah. they do, then the, the giants must've fumbled that one too, because it was yeah. a little intrusive there. I wouldn't be comfortable if it was my team necessarily. Yeah, you know, the Bears brought in, uh, this was three months ago, a new guy to be head of communications, kind of a special position that they had. And uh, that was the clue that we all should have known. They're going to be on hard knocks because that's going to be that guy's job to work shoulder to shoulder with the HBO producers and say, you can't use that. You can use this. And then during interviews, helping the players to what they say and so forth, which as a former communication specialist, that's the way to do it. You know, I, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but uh, Matt Eberflus, to me, is so much better this year behind the podium. He feels more comfortable. He, he, he's, he's more authentic. You know, he's been talking about uh, – uh, uh, Dave, you were talking about, you know, some of the X's and O's and stuff before the show and learning about that stuff. Eberflus is giving us uh, education about Austin Booker's strengths and what he does and moves, and he's good at the split, and he's good at using his arms and stuff. And that's stuff that he wasn't doing as much last year, and I bet you that came from the communication specialist and said, go up there and talk football and hopefully HBO will capture that too and uh, all of America but particularly Chicago Bears fans are going to feel really confident about the Bears after what HBO puts out tomorrow yeah I think Matt Eberflus had that really good glow up this offseason so I think that's kind of where the some of that uh, that charisma is maybe coming from too and all that but like I you know. said for sure I think they've all gotten a lot better at communicating maybe this year and I think like maybe part of that transition is uh even Ryan Poles seems a little bit looser this this offseason, right? And then Matt Eberflus seems – I think that pressure of being the losers and kind of having that that pressure of, like, answering for all these faults and, you know, wh why is this not working? Why is that not working? And now you kind of have this new approach and this new kind of – I don't know, this attitude about it. The air, in the, the air is a little different with, like, Caleb mm -hmm. and Rome and all this stuff. And if it doesn't work out, maybe it'll all resort – you know, back to what they were dealing with. Right. And it's like, why? Well, Caleb has all these tools. Why isn't it working and stuff like that? But I think you're right on the money and in terms of the communication being better. And maybe that's a little bit of help from that extra communications guy. Um, but for sure, I think there's just like a little different air in the building this off season. And I'm wondering if that's like performative or you think they're really just feeling it now, you know? 
I think there's a really, really good feeling. I mean, even back when Justin Fields was here, there were a lot of players on the Chicago Bears team who said, I really like what they're building here. They're doing it the right way, tear everything down, start from scratch. It's very painful for the players and, and the fans. We don't want to go through all that losing, but that truly is the best way to build an organization that's going to sustain success. And I think that with the acquisitions from this past season, this team is really, really feeling it at Hallis Hall. Uh, uh, and, you know, you got a, a dynamic guy like Caleb who comes in, you know, pr pretty polished because he's got done all the endorsement things. He knows how to talk. Everybody's talking about his leadership skills. He told the guys after practice uh, when they were going to go, you know, the final word, he said he gave them a mini lecture on cleaning up after themselves and being professional and so forth. You don't ever hear a rookie quarterback telling veterans in the NFL to clean up after themselves. It took balls on his part and he did it. And uh, the veterans afterwards were talking, you know, uh, with uh, admiration about that. But I do got to say this, uh, you know, uh, I disagree with you. I don't really want to see much of or any of McCaskey and very little of Warren. If Warren is going to be on, Paul, I think it has to be that he's doing something about the new stadium. But I don't want him talking football. I don't want him to talk about his days with the Cardinals and we won the Super Bowl and so forth. I want to hear from the players and the coaches. Yeah, and, you know, I think you're mostly going to get video on the players because those are the biggest characters. Those are the guys that – will give you the best show, the best entertainment product, if that's what you're after, you know. I mean, th there's some characters on this team, and they've already come out with little clips of, you know, DJ Moore and Keenan Allen talking mm -hmm. back and forth. And, um, you know, if, you, if you've if ever seen Demarcus Walker talk, you know, he's just he's just a good time to listen to. I mean, I, I'm not like that guy's my friend. He's just funny, you know. Um, Kyler Gordon's on there. Like, there's a lot, a lot of different characters. And yeah. um, it, you know, it definitely – it's wild because I, I said it so many times before, like, oh, it feels different. It feels different. It feels different. And this time I'm, I'm thinking, like, it is different. Yeah. Because even without Caleb, we still win this trade. We're not hamstringing ourselves desperately to try and grab something that isn't there in hopes of the future. No, we built this thing, and it still has a future. We have 10 draft picks next year, right? Yes, I mean, it, it still has plenty of options and paths to go no matter how the season goes mm -hmm. and ways to be able to, you know, fill holes and things like that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. He's, he's I laid guess, out a really nice plan for rebuilding a team. It's taken a little while, but it's a nice plan. Not to kind of intermix sports here, but like this does have a bit of the uh, I don't know how much of a Cubs fan versus a Sox fan you are, but it's got a little bit of that Theo Epstein 2016 Cubs vibe where. Sure. Theo Epstein came in and like top to bottom. And I've been, um, me and Polly have had many arguments about this where, you know, when you have like these fundamental changes, I think uh, as a franchise, you need to go as close to the top of the head of the snake as you possibly can. And that's where you start making the changes. But like the McCaskies are not going to give up ownership. I would love if Jeff Bezos owned the Chicago Bears. Don't like, you know what I mean? It's just, it is what it is. It's a competitive guy with lots of money, wants to win, wants to be successful. Yeah, but it's um, not going to happen. <laughs> but you can't get rid of the McCaskies, right? And that's kind of two part of my question is like the comment is, you know, 2016 Cubs vibe, I think is kind of here because of Kevin Warren and how much control they gave Ryan Poles for a change. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that McCaskies are just notorious for hiring yes men and guys that just agree with them and are just really polite to their faces and just do what they need them to do. But um, what do you think? And I, this has kind of been racking my brain and maybe somebody who's like more into the history of the McCaskies or like talks to people like Greg Gabriel. What do you think the McCaskies were working so hard to kind of hide or like shy away from and fighting off hard knocks for so long? Like, what do you think? Maybe not what we're going to see, because like you said, I hope we don't see too much McCaskey. And if we do, I almost want it to be like a, a Twitter moment where it's just like George is such a dork. Right. Um but like, what do you think they? What do you think it is about that that they were like fighting them off with the stick so hard? I think that they were listening to their head coaches. It, it's primarily it's been over the years. It's been Lovey Smith and the, the you know 
Tressman maybe not as much, but he wasn't that here that long. He couldn't do it in his rookie year because the uh, uh, the NFL will not allow a rookie coach to be featured on Hard Knocks. So in his second year, they probably were he, they were probably feeling you know we still got to fix some things before we had cameras rolling around. John Fox was certainly not going to let HBO cameras around. He's an old guy. He he was a guy that instituted the Greg Braggs rule at at camp. The so called so called Greg Braggs. Greg was taking great video at uh, practices and posting them on the internet and and John Fox was going crazy and that's when the Bears uh, now you can't pull out your cell phone camera unless you get you know look down like that you're gonna get shot by the local police out there so you know I I think it was them trying to appease their head coaches first and foremost I don't think that they were going they were trying to hide any you know dysfunction or anything like that they were just following the coach's word is my gut feel you know Eberflus has tricks up his sleeve so mm -hmm. we don't want to give any of those away, right? <laughs> uh, well, I think this new communications guy, you know, is is probably pretty good at saying, okay, this is how we get around some of that stuff. And don't you worry. In the edit, I'm not going to allow any of that stuff. So yeah. I think that's part of the formula as to why we're finally seeing them in hard knocks. I'm, I'm hyped, man. I'm ready to go. And Caleb, it is impressive to kind of see that, you know, finally we, we have a rookie doing some things right that, Looks like it's actually going to go on the path it's supposed to go on. I mean, I love the one clip. You know, it's hard to tell from ground level highlights what's going on and things like that. I mean, the Absolutely. best way is obviously to watch A22 film, right? But mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, there's this one clip where you can just see him looking left, looking left, and you see Tremaine Edmonds, 49, kind of go across the screen, and then he just throws right. And it's just like, okay, good, good job, kid. You looked off the linebacker, and he's a pretty good linebacker. You know what I mean? So it's like stuff like that that's – Nice to see from, you know, even a rookie quarterback. And I think there is absolutely no reason why um, why his progression has any, you know, huge obstacles that he won't grow exactly how he should. But, um, you know, a lot of people are, are placing a lot of crazy numbers out there. I mean, I've been hearing we're going to have three wide receivers with a thousand yards each. Okay, DJ well, yeah. Moore said that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So. Yeah, what do you think of that? I mean, because if that's the case, then, you know, you're throwing for a lot of yards there, right? There's, a, there's more than three guys on the team, so. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, between the tight ends, you got to add at least another 900,000. And the running back, you know, Swift is really good at uh, yards after the catch. So you're adding another four. Jeez, I mean, I don't see it happening. But, hell, maybe, maybe I'm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we will see, you know, at least Odunze get 800 and the two veteran receivers get 1,000. That would be sensational. And a lot of it, I think, in today's NFL is yards after the catch. Uh, you'll have the, the speedsters on the team to stretch off in, uh, defenses and, and connect on long ball from now now and then. And with Caleb's uh, escapability, he's going to create big uh, big play uh, uh, touchdowns or, or big gainers. So there is the chance to get a lot of yards. I just think that we should always, when you, we're talking about a rookie quarterback, should always temper expectations because you're going to be let down. I know it from Trubisky, Fields, and a number of other quarterbacks in Bears history. Do you know who holds the rookie record for passing yards? Oh, that's a good one. Man, I'm going to guess Jim McMahon. No, you actually just said his name. Um, who, who did I say? Short -term Mitch memory. It's Mitchell. Oh, oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and now you gotta you gotta admit though that a lot of those passes because I have an argument or debate every time with Mike North on uh, at the bar room when he's on. A lot of those yards that Trubisky completed were. You know, wide receiver screens, they were short passes, the ball was in the air, five, ten yards. His long ball, he didn't complete that many passes. And and intermediary uh passes, that, that there was also a drop there. You know, I think he, he benefited a lot from good defensive play and, and good uh yards after the catch. Uh what do you guys think? Yeah, I think so too. I mean my biggest joke with the last few coaches and the with Mitch specifically and then Fields, you know, is like, you ask Mitch Trubisky, like, what are you good at, Mitch? Like, what do you want to do? And he goes like, well, I, I'm pretty athletic. I like to sh throw short. 
you know, on, on the run. And then Matt Nagy was like, all right, shut up. Uh, four wide, <laughs> uh, throw deep, and bubble screens, you know. Um, and then fields, kind of the same thing, you know. It's like, hey, what do you like to do well? Like throw deep, and I'm really athletic. All right, man, we're going to make you a pocket passer, so shut up. And then we're going to, you know, just hand off on all these things. And it's just – so I think that's probably what you're alluding to with Caleb is just kind of – it's going to be nice to see these – and I'm seeing some comments, especially with uh, with Shorty here, with talking about DJ Moore, talking about making every play the same, and how you're saying a lot of the modern NFL is just run after the catch. And I think from what we've heard so far um, for Caleb, it's they're not going to ask him to do too much, and just you know you can read tea leaves in terms of what what people what moves you make and what you do. And I'm watching. I was doing a telling Polly, I'm doing a full rewatch of the uh, last season. And it's kind of fun when you when you watch every game in order, you kind of get a different vibe than when you live it week to week and you, every yes. emotions week to week and all that stuff. Yeah. But when you kind of go through it really quickly, all in all, there's a, such a tone to the season. I remember just thinking, man, if Cole Komet gets the ball a little bit more in open space and just give him a drag route, right? Open up the field on the outside, give him a drag route. DJ Moore, give him a slant for Christ's sake. I think I'm, I'm like 10, 11 games in. I don't think I saw more than 10 slants that were just executed, you know, on the run. Um, so I think that's kind of what you're alluding to is like, hopefully you're just not asking Caleb Williams to do too much. You got these skilled guys. DJ Moore is one of the best run after catch guys, like up there with AJ Brown, right? Just big, chunky, like stocky receiver who can shrug off some tackles. And then you can sprinkle in those like fun little splash plays with Rome and Keenan's your security blanket over the middle. Um, I'm probably taking DeAndre Swift in fantasy just because I think he's going to get like six catches, seven catches a game, right? Mm -hmm. They're giving these little – those. Uh, I'm watching a lot of Matt Waldron stuff. And he does a lot of those uh, – uh, statistically, he like goes into empty set more than anybody else from last year. But he did it with like motions. So he would have the, you know two running backs in the back. They both motion up. Now it's an empty – and it's just one of those like extended handoff plays, nice. right? It's like you get four, six yards, but it's, it's so automatic and stuff like that. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Is it going to lead to Caleb having a 4,000 yard season? Mm, maybe not just because that's not realistic, but I think hopefully that's what I'm, that's the tea leaves I'm seeing right now is just kind of like simple, simple, simple. Let the defense do some work. I'm not feeling too confident about this O-line right now. So like, hopefully, you know, it's just keeping it simple and not asking him to be the hero in season one. Cause that would be the quickest way to ruin another quarterback. Right. Is like mm -hmm. we ask, we keep asking these guys to be a hero in their first and second season to get their, their brains bashed in. Yeah. You know, and you're right. I agree with you. It's we've had so many offensive coordinators in the past saying we're going to build the offense around the talents of the players, and we've never really seen that. And so, hopefully, Shane is the guy that's going to live up to that expectation because we know that's the best way to win uh, football games. He's got so many weapons, and so now it's just about scouting the opposition for the next week, and then saying, okay, we've got these players or these formations or or these strengths on our our offense that can combat their weaknesses, you know, because we the versatility of players and formations that they have. They can run two tight ends out of the back, which I saw Seattle do last season. They can do a three wide receiver set with two tight ends. Wouldn't be good for DeAndre Swift, but that it could be one of the formations that they do. And or they can have you know DeAndre Swift lined out and then in motion putting him in the running back position with the two tight ends already in the field, and then boom, he's gone on a long run or a long pass catch. So they've got all this, these weapons that allow Shane to be uh, uh, versatile, but also, you know, if he, if he can figure out a good plan every week to use these players strengths and that versatile plan for each week, this could be a real explosive offense. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, I want to let Shorty know that at some point I did have hair. I know it's hard to believe, but I, it used to be long and luscious. And um, and then I, I must have been – I was not that old. I mean, me and David were still working together, I think, maybe. I was like 24 years old, and for Halloween, I decided to go as a blue man group, right? And I'm just going to be fully dedicated and shave my head. And then like <laughs> six months later, I'm like, it's not coming back. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> like, oh. So, yeah, that's how that went. And then 
the hair just went, and now I can rest. And then, yeah, just like, <laughs> all right. Uh, sat down to have a few beers with a longtime uh, film cameraman in Chicago. And this was back, you know, in the last century. So we're, you know, uh, crews, TV crews were still shooting film, you know, lace up. The, and so he was relaying this story that when he was in his early 20s, he w w went out to shoot some film with one of the big producers in Chicago and stuff. And then he realized that he had done something wrong wrong when he was threading the film and the camera and that the film was probably going to come out all overexposed or burn-ins and stuff like that and he said i could literally see the hair from my head falling down because he was so stressed out and uh you know <laughs> <laughs> that scared the shit out of me because I, I was in my early 20s and in the business of shooting film thinking I don't want to ever be that fucking oh, excuse my language, uh, terrified of uh, you know uh, losing my hair just because I did something wrong at work wow <laughs> yeah you know I actually I always wanted to you know go as George Costanza and dedicate myself to that and now I could probably pull that off pretty well. Oh, yeah. so, you I know, so. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, you know, I have I have conflicting thoughts because on, on one end, I definitely think and believe that he does deserve to be in the top 100. And especially like he said, if, if a guy who didn't play last year can make it, then, you, you know, what's the deal here? And so I, I get that part of it and I get the disrespect part of it. But, and, you know, and when you took it, take a look at who's ahead of him, you know, there are some names that you can see he's better than that. But I've always still considered him to be just like a very, very good player. And still not necessarily a superstar. You know what I mean? And also, I think it, it doesn't help being on a losing team, a losing right. roster. And so I think maybe next year he'll make that list and he'll crack that list. But I, I can kind of understand it to a degree a little bit of why it didn't happen but yeah he took it seems like he took it a little personal huh he did you know and the thing is it's like if you remember a, a year ago at this point there was division between chicago bears fans as to whether jalen should be uh, extended a, a given a contract extension because he's he, everybody would say he's, he doesn't make interceptions that's the big thing that's the big thing and as soon as they traded for montez sweat all of a sudden <laughs> he's, he's making interceptions because all of the best uh, uh, interceptors in the National Football League have a pass rush, and the Bears had nothing resembling a pass rush before Montez Sweat. So that was the big thing. The other thing I'd like to say is I think a lot of this voting stuff by NFL players, you know, they get this stuff in the mail, or they print it out from email, and so and they hand it to, to you know their son, you know, hey, uh, a guy at the bar, you want to fill this out for me? They don't take it seriously, and so that I, you know, there's a lot of factors why he, he's out of that 100. I would add those to uh, Paul to to your uh, assertion. Funny thing is, is actually I'm pointing at one of the guys who didn't want to give Jalen a. A contract. So, <laughs> no, uh, I, I, for the right price. Well, for the right price. But that, that's my thing is because I don't, that's it, because he didn't have the interceptions. And although you hit the nail on the head, it's it's the defensive line pressure that matters so much mm -hmm. to create opportunities for these guys. I mean, we always talk back about the 2006 season and point to a guy like Nate Vasher. I think he had seven interceptions that year. And if yeah. you look at him, it's always just right place, right time. He never right. matched that number throughout the rest of his career. And, yeah, there was defensive line pressure that year, and <laughs> things were going according to plan, and you were going to have opportunities at turnovers. And so, you know, m at the beginning of the year, we did bold predictions, David. I don't know if you remember. We did uh, an offensive bold prediction and a defensive bold prediction. And my defensive one was that Jalen Johnson would get two interceptions, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, that's that's where it was at. And so when it comes to contract time, I think yeah. when we discussed it, $18 million's right kind of where it made sense to us even. And then for it to happen that way was just like, wow, that is really, you know, it's a good contract on both sides. Because if he wanted to be the top paid corner in the league, I mm -hmm. probably would have passed, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so funny because you said it that way. I remember the, the way you predicted it was hilarious because you went, he's going to double his career total this season with two. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Guilty? Yeah. And then, no, yeah, we, we basically said it because I said give him 20, you said 16, and they gave him out, you know, 18. So that makes sense. Two things about that list, which although I think perfect, like what you said, 
for Jalen, poor Jalen, because they did do honorable mentions in that list. So he was like, maybe I was 101. He's not even 110, which I is, I think that's silly as hell. Two, like you were saying, with these guys that just fill this list out either arbitrarily or honestly, I think it's by feeling sometimes. Because oh, yeah. when you go back to last year's 100, top 100, I think Justin Fields is in like the 40s or the 60s. And I mean, we all, you know, we, we don't say those names anymore. This is the Voldemort now, you know, it's like JF, you just say that guy, but like, that you know, in Pittsburgh, that guy <laughs> in Pittsburgh, he's really like, he was fun to watch that, that one season, but to say he was the 40th best player in the league is silly. And then the third thing I'll say about it is any list that has this and doesn't have Patrick Mahomes at one is just null and void. Right. And he was number four this year. So, like, you can't tell me that every th – these players are kind of just, like, butthurt that he's knocking them out of the playoffs. He's winning rings every year, and he, they're just mad that – you know. So, I don't know what it is Jalen Johnson did to piss everybody off, but, I mean, like, he, he deserves to be at least in the 100. I mean, that's guaranteed. And I think the, the, the other part of it, you know, I don't, I don't know if this was mentioned. I don't think it was, is, you know, he wasn't – on national TV enough, or he didn't have those games on national TV that helped that, you know, a lot of football players, they just, they watch game a week. They, how can they vote on somebody they, they didn't even see play last season? And that's what's probably the case with a lot of these guys that voted. They never saw uh, Jalen Johnson play because I, I want to say, was it was the last national TV game they had last year was against the commanders early in the night. There was one afterwards. Um, Man, I, see, this is where I want to say it was the Packers. This is where Dan Aguire fits right in. He would, yeah, right. know, he would know who commented it. I mean, that guy's memory is crazy. I no, I, I, get, I don't get what you're getting at. Although, it's like you know, he had two picks against the Raiders. He had a pick against the Commanders. These kind of like these not super great quarterbacks, but you know, like mm -hmm. I mean, when you're still making uh, Jair Alexander considered one of the best. You know, I remember. I remember a few Packers games watching lately where uh, who was our, who was the guy we got from the Patriots? Just Nikhil, Harry. Jair, Nikhil Harry. And then he just yeah. toasted Nikhil, uh, toasted Jair Alexander. And you still got Jair Alexander being a top, you know, whatever 50 player. And that guy's <laughs> Looney Tune yeah. now. So. I'm hoping uh, Jalen keeps it up because, you know, what I bet you know, my social security check that uh, Jalen Johnson is going to have a Pro Bowl caliber season this season. My heart as a Bears fan would say yes, but given the body of work, I don't, I don't think it's a sure bet. I, the guy is good. A lot is going to depend about what happens around him. Is Montez Sweat and Jervon Dexter, you know, because those are the two primary pass rushers as of today, uh, maybe uh, Booker. Are those guys going to pr provide a, a push to help the defensive backs? Is uh, uh, Tyreek Stevenson going to be, you know, that other lockdown type cornerback? And he's shown signs that he can be so that Jalen Johnson could get passes thrown his way. <laughs> you know? So th there's a lot of different factors involved. Uh, I, I, you know, as, again, as a Bears fan, I, I will say they're going to go 17 and 0 and win the Super Bowl 100 and nothing. But when I put my head down in the bill, I go, what the hell did I say? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's interesting. Did you see, uh, would you take a look at the schedule, Paul? I did find this. I did find that we were scheduled for four. We we're scheduled for the Washington one. Okay. The Chargers. Oh yeah. We're scheduled. The Panthers and then the Vikings week twelve. Okay. I, yeah. I'm not sure if Panthers they would have been right? the last one. I th probably. I, yeah. so Panthers was adjusted. a Thursday nighter. Right. I think the Vikings one was flexed. Yeah. Yeah. I think okay. the Chargers might have been flexed too, because I think at that point Justin Herbert was hurt and Justin Fields. But to all those points, like yeah, for sure. I was doing the numbers and I saw the statistic. Uh, ten, ten or eight games into the season, uh, Jalen Johnson was targeted. Uh, I want to say like twenty-six times. By the time Tyreek Stevenson was targeted, about like eighty times. Mm -hmm. So like last year, I mean, it's just one of those things where like corners have a hard time. Uh, you know, justifying their stats when they're not getting picks. But if you're not getting thrown at, that's kind of part of the whole justification of the stats, right? It's like, he's yep. so locked down. I'm not even going to look that way. I'm just going to abuse the other guy. And yep. so like what Tyreek is kind of proving is he's no scrub now. Uh, you know, he had that one game against the Raiders. He locked up Devonte Adams. I mean, I, I remember a few games where he locked up a couple of like number ones, 
towards the middle end of the season for Tyreek. And then Kyler, who, you know, got a lot better. Terrell, uh, Terrell Smith is getting, you know, some time now. So that four, that mm-hmm. dime set's looking really good. And then, um, yeah, I think part of that is what you're alluding to is like, would you bet your, your social on, on the, uh, on Jalen Johnson having a year, a, he didn't get paid like a top, top flight corner and B, I mean, until he does it again, he's a guy who played really well in his contract year. So this is the year, right? Cause like we've seen it a hundred times in the NFL is guys get super motivated. They play like balls to the wall, lights out their contract year, they get paid and then they chill and then they kind of take a little dip, but hopefully this pissed them off just enough to kind of you know, like I'm that disrespected. I got paid in a good year and that's what I get. Like, I think it might've been a kind of blessing in disguise. I'm not one of those rah, rah guys, but it might've been. His interceptions did all come from backup quarterbacks, I believe. And so, um, so media, listen, low level starters or, or backups. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then two, um, you know, he could not be getting thrown at because he's locked the guy down or he could not be getting thrown at because it's easier to target the other holes. Sure, absolutely. Because we were weaker in those spots. So there's right. different ways of looking at it. I'm just saying. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I think now uh, secondary might be one of the great, good strengths on this team. So, um, yeah, Jalen Johnson might see his first share of targets all of a sudden, I think. I think it was a fortuitous thing because, you know, as Dave said and you said, Paul, you, know, you got the first half of the season. They're not throwing Jalen's way. They're p- trying to pick on Tyreek, and Tyreek was challenged. And a lot of times he lost. He'd come up with a great play, but then a play later, pass interference for 40 yards and stuff, or got beat for a touchdown and so forth. So th- during that time, though, Jalen is gaining more confidence because he's saying to himself, you guys are afraid to throw to me. I mean, he literally was saying that to the opposite team. You guys are afraid to throw to me. And Tyreek, he's a tough SOB. He's getting, you know, steal. He, he is, uh, what's the word that I want? He, he's getting steal out of being challenged over and over. He's so competitive. He just said, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. And by the second half of the season, the guy was playing rookie of the year level. So it could have been all, you know, a uh, uh, divine intervention that finally the Bears get a break and, and this worked out in, in their favor. We always try to call a few things early, but I remember like it was like week eight or week nine. And I'm like, Polly, this is a top five defense towards the end of the season. So like halfway through, you know, once they got Montez Sweat and they started clicking and the defense started going through, I think we ended up being pretty OK with that just because I think they stumble into a few things. I think people tend to forget. And even like this year is this uh we did the math it was like nine out of 11 starters from 2022 to 2023 were brand new mm-hmm. Every, like nine out of 12 even uh, it was a we don't have to go through the list but now you got you know i think they stumbled into a few upgrades as well with jervon dexter really that was one of my guys man i really am i'm glad that like everybody else is kind of on that train now too because I was really loving that kid towards the end of the season. And then I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I don't think there's much of a downgrade possible than Eddie Jackson. Mm -hmm. So the Kevin (laughs) Byard thing towards the end of last year, like Eddie Jackson, I mean, was just an absolute turnstile. He he is like the last safety to finally go somewhere. And I think so. It's not even our instinct. The league isn't, it's it's throwing that out there. Yeah. Kevin Byard is going to be a huge upgrade. And he's already like getting huge praises in training camp for just a guy that's always in the right spot. He's Mm -hmm. like seen it all. He's 10 years in. Yeah, sure. He maybe is like losing a step or something, but he's a captain of the defense kind of thing, you know? Like, have you you can tell people what to do? Have you heard the press conference with him? Yeah. I mean, he's smart too. Very smart. Great, great leader, you know, uses his experience to help teach the younger guys. You know, this past, I think he was at the podium on Saturday and or, or yeah, Saturday, and he was talking about the other young defensive backs. And he said, you know, frankly, I don't consider them young. You know, Brisker and, uh, of course, Jalen Johnson and Tyreek, they've all played a lot of games. Tyreek, you know, one season and Brisker two two or three seasons, he said. And then Jalen, of course, is, is Pro Bowl caliber. I don't consider these guys young, and I consider them you know, really hungry. Every one of them wants to get to the next level, wants to get Pro Bowl and so forth. So he was, you know, the way he talks up that defensive back room uh, is so effing impressive, and it, it – 
I don't think he's blowing smoke. You know, a lot of times it's this time of the year, everybody's having a great camp, you know. They turn on the NFL network and they're at one camp. Yeah, things are great over here. Let's throw it to another camp. Yeah, things are great over here. Let's throw it to another camp. Things are even great over here. It's like, come on. It can't be that good. <laughs> Funny how you say that because I think that's where we all heard the uh, the Caleb Williams water bottle story, right, the pick up your yeah. towels thing from Kevin Byard. And yeah. it's so funny because, like, in society now, right? Nobody can ever find a freaking middle ground. And it's so funny because you had people, and I remember him mentioning the water bottle thing. And instantly I just remembered that clip from NFL films of Ed Reed talking about how the the year they won the Super Bowl. Yes. And he was just like, boys, it's about the little things. Like you guys, it, it, if this is how you treat your locker room and your space, then no wonder like your head's not in the right place because you're not on it in that level. Do you remember that, Paul? Twitter. No, I posted yeah, it on Twitter immediately. recently on our, on our Bearski Twitter. Yeah. Right, just immediately. I, it's Nothing just, said, just video clip. posted. Yep, <laughs> and, uh, and then it's so funny because then you have like people like Amani Toomer, if you remember Amani Toomer in like the 2000s, the Giants receiver, and he's going out there going like, who the hell does this guy think he is? And he's what a joke. And like this is going to be, uh, forget who he said, some rookie quarterback all over again. And then this and that. And it's just so stupid that we can't ever and, find some like nice middle ground. But I'm personally and, a fan. And meanwhile, meanwhile, last year, when talks about drafting Jalen Carter came up, one of the things Ryan Pohl said is uh, he mentioned leadership in the locker room, not maybe being where it needs to be. And I think that might have changed real quick the second Caleb got there. And you see that in great quarterbacks. It's one of the things that really gets me excited. Mm -hmm. Well, and I totally agreed with Ryan. You know, there's no doubt that Jalen Carter has all the tools to be a phenomenal defensive tackle, probably play at the same level as Aaron Donald. But it was clear that they spent a lot of time with the guy and did a lot of investigative work. This guy, you, we couldn't gamble on his maturity level, not getting him in trouble. And he, there's still pending lawsuits on him, people accusing him of this or that. So he's not completely out of the woods. And the Bears didn't have, you know, uh, they had some veterans on the team, but it's not like the Eagles. The Eagles are, you know, a complete veteran team, offense and defense. That was a perfect situation for Carter. And we've we've been, as Bears fans, I, I think you guys are like me, you know, for years and years we've been saying, hey, how about the offensive line? How about the offensive line? So now you're able to trade back pick up Darnell right as a cornerstone right tackle, get a little more draft assets. And so uh, applause, applause for Ryan Pose. I think that that was a win for him. Now, Carter could end up being a Hall of Famer, uh, but if Darnell Wright makes it to a few Pro Bowls and so forth, I will still stand by the fact that I think he made the right decision. You know what's funny about the Eagles? They're the defensive coordinators. They went from Sean Desai to Vic Fangio. Yes, <laughs> we went from Vic Fangio to Sean Desai. I'm pretty sure. I That's, think they do it right yeah, over there. And, uh, right. We might have yeah. it backwards. Dumb it. <laughs>